Oh, do you hear that? <laughs> Big Brother is watching you. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um, uh, anyone who is joining, don't worry. Um, the only thing being recorded is our, our kind of Zoom um, video and audio. So, any questions that you do ask, uh, we will just read the comment without reading your name. So, don't worry. It'll be yeah. anonymous <laughs> um, in that sense. Yeah. Um, so, Roxanne, are you okay um, watching the chat there? And I can. Yes, I have it right here. Cool. I'm seeing everything. Great. And I'll watch this stuff on my end. Um, great. So, everyone who, who has joined, um, of course, this is going to be nice and informal and open. Uh, but at the same point, we did write some things down that we wanted to touch on that we know are helpful and that we've had many people ask us about in previous webinars and uh, workshops. So um, yeah, we're going to record this. So if anyone isn't available to watch this live, it will be recorded for future. Um, and we'll share that around. Um, so I guess the first thing to kind of just ask um, you, Roxanne, and I'll share my perspective after is, what is harm reduction to you? We'll start with that. Oh my God. I know it's a, good, it's a big one. It's a big one. But like, however you like, and I'll even try to help add some. Yeah. To <laughs> I think harm reduction for me is a philosophy that applies to so many things. I think we talk about it a lot when we talk about drugs. But for me, it's, well, I'm a sexologist too. Um, I have a training in sexology and I'm currently doing my master's as well. And it also applies to sexuality or sexual behavior. It also applies to like, just I think in general, mental health in general, like exercise. Anything, <laughs> exercise yeah, like I think it's it's just like, a and for me personally, when I found out about harm reduction, it just made so much sense because it was already something that like I was going by a little bit, but then I learned that there was a word for it and that people were actually like calling it something. But it's like, for, yeah, for me, I think it's a philosophy where we know that people will have, will do something and we want them to be the most comfortable and the most safe or the safest they can be while doing that. So in regards to drugs, I think it's, or a substance use of any kind of substance, it's like, well, if you're going to do it anyways, might as well have like clean, um, not supply, but like clean, clean method, clean environment, um, try to know what you're getting into, have information about to do it, like how to do it safely or to be safe uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, but like, so yeah. That's really well said, actually, with the the safety aspect, because look at doctors are supposed to be the original harm reductionists of like your overall well being, yeah. right? Your family doctor, or if you see primary care, they're supposed to be the ones that when it comes to all body systems, they're trying to reduce the harm. So they they do yeah. tests, they ask you questions, and maybe you say something to them like, "Oh, I eat so much candy every night until I fall asleep, and I'm so sick in the morning," and they'll go, "Hmm." harm reduction wise, is there a way to slow down? I mean, I know you love candy. You're not going to stop. Like this yeah. is a normal thing for doctors, but when it comes to drug use and mental health, yeah, you do get some yeah. weird. And even with sexuality, um, some doctors can be taken a bit aback when it comes to the harm reduction approach. So, I, I mean, that must make your job a lot um, more interesting when supporting folks who, you know, they could be stigmatized, you know, even having like a sex addiction, they'd say, or um, yeah, the right wording for that. I'm not sure what it is right now, but yeah, someone who, who struggles with that is probably afraid to even reach out because doctors yeah, are understanding. Yeah, for sure. And I think in an all or nothing approach, you just said it, I think we're going to lose people, literally, like what happens when your doctor says, stop eating candy all together, that's not good for you, what are you going to do? You're either going to actually stop, which I think is not the majority of the people that would be in that situation. You're going to what? You're going to do it anyways, but hide it from your doctor. And then he's not going to understand why your blood sugar is like through the roof. Or you're, you're going to do it and find another doctor or do it and just stop going to the doctor at like all together you know, or and that's yeah. how we avoid conflict with human beings. Cause the only reason that we can't, and a lot of people forget this, the reason that we can't just change behaviors that are causing harm to us is that there's so many complex factors. Yes. We say biopsychosocial plus, right? Because yeah. even biologically our body, our mind and our environment don't always explain everything. So yeah. um, that's why harm reduction is so important. And when it comes to trip sitting, 
that is that is like the basic harm reduction for psychedelics where you know psychedelics that are tested and pure and like the, the common ones right like psilocybin lsd mdma <clears throat> have very low physiological risk factors you know they don't really affect heart rate and blood pressure directly they don't typically cause overdoses at all um but it's when they're not pure or when they're cut with things that are harmful yeah people, or combined or combined especially yeah. without without understanding there's a lot of people yeah. who will just think you know and i and there are teenagers who do that maybe at parties they're having a couple drinks their inhibitions are lower they'll probably try a couple things um but i think with the right approaches and harm reduction um you know people will understand um mm -hmm. and then when it comes to testing that's another big part of harm reduction yeah. that we'll talk about a bit later um but yeah so trip sitting is basically the harm reduction for psychedelics that the person understands what they're taking is a psychedelic um that but there are other factors to it that um i wouldn't say can cause direct harms but can put you in situations that are overwhelming and yeah. overwhelming situations can be traumatizing if not processed um so yeah being an ethical like trip sitter that's another part of this right so there's yeah. trip sitting is the act of holding space for somebody <clears throat> or sitting with them while they're in an altered state of consciousness um you can apply this term to even somebody in states of you know crisis you know of having a panic attack uh, what we'd call you know states yeah. of psychosis um, but yeah sitting there holding space you're not guiding you're not um mm -hmm. curing with therapy and things like that um but we'll kind of break down what that kind of means so like to you roxanne what would be like ethical trip sitting or ways to know that you know you're an ethical trip sitter you have the right intentions if you're helping somebody in that space oh my god that's such a big question i think oh my god that's so complex right um i think first of all you need to assess like where you stand like you said what are you doing it for is it do you feel like do you feel compelled to do it do you want to be with this person how like how how do you feel about what's what's going on about the person just in general and stuff like that so <clears throat> are you doing it for money that was promised to you solely like it can be a bunch of things right um and i'm not saying always do it for free or always get paid. <laughs> I know what you mean, what like, but like the idea of it being just to gain money. Yeah, yeah just a, yeah, somebody. just power like another job, like like anything else. I, I think that's that's that would be something. That would be a factor that maybe could make things go a little bit wrong because it's just like know. a surgeon, though, right? You don't want a surgeon who's only yeah. thinking about the paycheck and not the yeah. person they're working like, on. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna buy a second home. Yeah, like yeah. that's not. <laughs> That's not how I want my surgeon to come into the operating room. You're right. <laughs> so that's a good one to kind of uh, a pause on there is intention. Like, so in, in yeah. the world right now uh, of psychedelics and certain substances that aren't fully legalized yet, I, we see in the States, there's a lot of efforts to not only decriminalize, but fully legalize psychedelics. This webinar is not on the political ideologies of legalized versus decrim. Um, but <laughs> we all have our own perspectives on that. Yeah, but the yeah. idea is that right now, um, especially in lots of places in Canada, psychedelics are still considered illegal, um, but they're very low priority when it comes to other substances. Um, but um, th that's the thing to remember right now when it comes to trip sitting and harm reduction, that um, your intention that this person, like, how are you coming into this? Is it a friend of yours yeah. that says, I'm curious and I'm gonna take some psychedelics? Mm -hmm. Or is you're at a festival or a party and somebody is there and they've they've done it and they're they're saying, hey, look, I'd like some support. Or are you going out of your way to push them on people and try to get yeah. them? To That's where we get into a gray yeah. area where we're not there, um, where we're prescribing things um, because yeah. there's so many factors into what goes into an experience, right? That's what I was gonna say. Like it, it there. That's something that I've seen in the last years uh, in my involvement in the community. Some people, and I, and I get it because when I first discovered psychedelics, I was like oh my God, how, how did I not know about this? This is amazing. And it, and it is, it is for some people. And I see sometimes the excitement turning into kind of pressure to be like, and, and it's fine if you wanna talk about psychedelics all the time, that's okay. But I think there's a line between talking about it because you're passionate and then 
thinking that it's going to be the what anyone at any given time needs for any problem that they have or that they might have or that they come to you to tell you that they have yeah. so like if i have a friend that that has um that has a lot of anxiety like it might help but it might not help too and i'm not like if the reason why i want to trips it is that i can tell them oh, I really want you to try this. I think it's really going to help. It's really going to help. And then they give in and the own, like, because you're going to be there and whatever. I think that's also something to consider. Like, That's that's why I think it's good that um, we remember the difference of prescribing, right? And that's also, I yeah. remember as, as a paramedic, paramedics don't prescribe people medications or treatments. We follow protocols and we have a doctor mm -hmm. that oversees that. So yeah. if I'm giving someone a medication for a heart attack, that's a volatile medication. And if I'm just saying, take this, take this, take this, I'm actually supposed to explain to them the risks of the drug too. Yeah, true. Okay, this might help. And I also have to say, we don't know for sure it's a heart attack because we haven't done blood work and that's how you know. Yeah. So here's the reasons why I'm suggesting it. And that's a drug though, that's legal in that situation in context. Yeah. So I think that's good to remember. Like, yes, the, the times that um, people approach you and say, hey, look, I heard you're comfortable I, I'm going to do this. Now you're our harm reductionist. Perfect. Um, and, and yeah, just even saying to people that like, if you're at a party and you know, you notice someone's going to do it, just say to them, Hey, look, I'm comfortable and I'm here just like a first aider, right? Yeah. Like someone says I have a, a seizure disorder. Okay. Well, I know what to do if someone has epilepsy. I know how to handle a seizure. You know, I'm over here if you need me. So um, yeah. good. Um, I think just to break that for anyone who has a hesitation or like a stigma towards what we're talking about here, that harm reduction is just avoiding harms. And it's essential and it's not um, postulatizing or like pushing yeah. things on people. And um, there's like yeah. other ways. I just want to add that there's like other ways to do harm reduction to other than trip sitting. So like, um, I think there's a lot of harm reduction that can be done before someone um, goes into a trip or like, like you said, someone comes to you and they say, oh, you, you talked about drugs before. Do you know I want to try this, whatever, with a bunch of friends or with my partner or whatever at home or alone? Um, and you can, even if they don't like specifically want you to be there or you don't want to trips it, you can still um, give them information or point them toward resources that will, that would be harm reduction too. And it's like a different kind of involvement. Uh, but yeah, here we're talking about trip sitting specifically. But no, that's actually a good point of it too. Harm reduction extends beyond that. And I mean, even mm -hmm. at the safe injection sites, people don't just come to use substances in the site themselves. They might come for equipment or just a chat. So good harm reduction sometimes is a conversation. Yeah, true. And asking them like, what do you know? Um, and just talking about what is understood. Um, yeah. So let's see here. Um, or right, before we go further, Jake, I think that uh, we didn't actually tell people who we are. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's a good sign, by the way. <laughs> You're talking about like first responders oh, or yeah, like yeah. EMT, whatever. And like I know. <laughs> yeah, out of context, it does sound strange. So um, let, let's start. Let's start with you because you mentioned a bit about what you do. But what exactly? Yeah, do you do? true. <laughs> um, I do a lot of things. Um, so I'm, I have a bachelor's in sexology. Uh, so yes, that's a real thing. <laughs> um, and I'm currently, uh, writing my, my thesis, my master's thesis in sexology as well. And, um, yeah, I'm the executive director of the Montreal Psychedelic Society here in Montreal. Um, so we do, we're like a community, basically we're like, we're like, yeah, we're like lube for the psychedelic community in Montreal, basically. We're like, hey, people get to know each other. And then we just facilitate spaces for people to hang out and, and find people who are like-minded um, and to just, we have integration circles too. We have a book club, um, stuff like that. And, um, and yeah, I do sanctuaries in events. So like festivals, mass gatherings, um, also in the burn, Burning Man community in general. So basically um, sanctuaries is like, it's typically a space uh, that's a little bit calmer than what's going on in like, let's say a festival. So you'll have like 
a, pla a place where you're like protected from the rain, let's say, and there's light uh, and cushions and stuff. And you can just tea sometimes a, a lot of the time. Yeah. Really good teas. And <laughs> it's like a kindergarten Snaps. for adults. <laughs> yes. That's how you. I like to call That's it. The, I've never heard that said before. Yeah. About, um, yeah. Like, these types of like harm reduction tents. <laughs> Perfect. And it's literally that. Like we have coloring books, we have slinkies, we have beautiful rocks so that people can just look at rocks and be amazed. We have like painting, all kinds of stuff so that people can just like process or change their mind, like change change the path that they're going on. Sometimes you start in a spiral if you're like taking a substance or something and you just want a place where you can be chill. There's no like big bass music in your face and you can just like take a breather uh get some tea some water some fruits whatever and then you also know that there will be some volunteers there that are sober and trained to um, respond to your needs if there's anything and with good intentions and that's why these festivals these harm reduction tents work so well because yeah. you're volunteering these people volunteering sometimes long shifts like i've done them before where they've been eight or 12 hour shifts because we really really want the service to run through the entire festival yeah um, and a lot of the paramedics over in Nova Scotia, where I worked, would go out to this Evolve Festival and help assist with that. And yeah. we'd have the medic tent right next to this big, what's called the tea hive, which is yeah, what you're exactly. talking about. Yeah. And hey, any issues, we would just help each other. Yeah, out. yeah exactly. And, and the intentions are always so wonderful because the passion and, you know, people are usually yeah. experienced in that space. Yeah, exactly. And it's like such a, it's a safer space, basically. And there's like, you know that there's, well, I hope that people know because that's what we try to put forward that there's like no judgment. You know, if you took like, you don't even know what you took because you just put your hand in a jar and took whatever your friend was giving you, like, that's okay. We're there, you know, we'll be there with you throughout the thing and it's going to be okay. And whatever comes up psychologically, like it sometimes yeah. when you're in altered states, things come up that really need to be addressed and processed. And yeah, you know, the whole idea of like, um, having having somebody that you can say anything to, you know, with certain parameters, like, oh, I'm going to go and kill somebody right now, or I'm going to go and kill myself, which are the two yeah. lines drawn of, okay, we're going to have to bring this to other people now, like call my yeah, yeah. one. But like, short of that, you have like being able yeah. to say something like, hey, look, I um, really was mean to this person in a past relationship. And like, I didn't know at the time, but I can tell right now I was so horrible to them. And I thought yeah. I was just being, you know, whatever. Yeah. And you don't want that person to go, well, hmm, you shouldn't treat people like that. It's like, I know that's the problem. I'm trying to realize that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's important. So that, yeah. thanks for sharing that. Anything else that you're kind of really um, involved in right now? Uh, well, so in a few weeks, I'm actually starting a new job in Montreal, and that's going to be really exciting. Uh, there's an organization in Montreal called Grip, Grip Montreal, and um, they do harm reduction at events, uh, but it's like on the more like prevention side of things. So they ha usually hand out like little cards with like information. They have the drug combination chart. They have like straws and whatever you can go. They have condoms. And um, they have a new mobile drug testing service. So in a van, we're gonna have a spectrometer and we'll be able to test people's substances in the van and just uh, do some literal harm reduction. <laughs> um, yeah, with people. So that's really cool and I'm really stoked. And that, that's needed for sure. As long as yeah. you know, you know, we people are still having to, you know, get um, illicit substances there's always that need yeah. to test with powders um, yeah. and liquids and the pandemic really also uh like it, it's, it's like an all-time all-time low of quality of substances like yeah like people forget crazy. like the border changes and stuff yeah. affect supplies coming in and always even illegal supplies and exactly um, fentanyl has now been laced with more and more things than ever before yeah. so you know, fentanyl yeah. used to be the scary thing. Now it's these other things cut in. So with your yeah. services, um, even things like MDMA can sometimes be cut. And this might be a good time to mention, like, what are things that can be cut into psychedelics that are, are potentially harmful? Mm -hmm. MDMA is one that's known all the time to have amphetamines put in. So if you're someone who's not expecting a stimulant, yeah. um, you could have a heart condition or bad anxiety and not know. Yeah. And then that puts you into a bad space. Um, some, MDA uh, sometimes too, in MDMA a lot. 
that's that, more on the psychedelic side. So sometimes it takes you by surprise. You're like, oh shit, oh. I thought I was just going to be happy today. And now I'm seeing visuals and it's kind of weird, but it's like, yeah. That's a really good point. And that's where we're with LSD. There's the N-bomb family that are the research chemicals that can sometimes cause cardiovascular effects. So again, someone who's not expecting these things can be very harmful to them. Um, but the pure psychedelics, so maybe someone goes to a testing site and their LSD is 100% LSD or the yeah. MDMA is pure MDMA, um, then that person, there's less of a chance that they're going to, of course, the prevention is what's great there. And mm-hmm. then, then it's all about the yeah. pre- the um, trip sitting and, and set and mm-hmm. setting, and then they're not as concerned. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's and and do. combinations. Like combinations. that's my big thing. I tried to tell people because one time when I, I was doing a sanctuary at one event, um, and it was kind of unofficial sanctuary. It was my first one actually. It was just my camp, but it ended up being the sanctuary because that's just <laughs> what we brought in, not knowing. Naturally. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we had the drug combination chart, and I thought I had worked with this chart for so long that I thought everyone knew about it or almost everyone knew about this chart. And the whole weekend people came into our space, they saw the chart and they were like, wow, this is so cool. I've never seen this in my life. And I was like, okay, this this was like a moment for me. And then I realized that a bunch of people, why it's interesting to have this chart is because the, with the war on drugs and prohibition and stuff, pharmacists will tell you when you go and take your antidepressant from the pharmacy or your your antibiotic, let's say you go to take an antibiotic, they'll say, oh, by the way, don't drink grapefruit juice because it's gonna interact with like this this medication, but then never tell you like, oh, you're on antidepressants, maybe don't take MDMA, it's not such a good idea. They'll never tell you that, but there could be very, real consequences of combining these two things depending there's a lot of factors but like oh yeah that's the that's the big point is that when we keep the education only in the hands of like doctors and you know pharmacists people can still like and it's not like it's it it, these are easy to follow like they're set up that it tells you like this might cause harm this will cause harm do not do it um, so that's really good. And especially with like, um, sedatives and, and things like that, mm-hmm. people tend to think mixing them are okay when mm-hmm. some might not be as bad as others, but typically the rule of thumb is not to yeah. do that because they can cause extra effects. So good point. Yeah. Um, so that's why testing is huge and understanding a substance yeah. before someone takes it. So if you are someone who's going to sit with somebody, make sure they know what they're taking and that they, they know um, they can at least get testing access. Hopefully you can get reagent kits now online, yeah. which are, are fairly accurate. Um, and usually in big cities, you also have a couple of organizations that will give out fentanyl strips for yeah. free too. So you can at least test for fentanyl, like <clears throat> maybe not your psilocybin, but like. Which is less hazardous luckily with that, but you're right. Yeah. That, but the cool part too in Toronto, we have multiple drug testing centers. So at like, yeah, for yeah. example, like the works or Parkdale, um, Queen West community health center, you can go there and bring in substances to be tested in mass spectrometer, just like oh, your, nice. your job was going to do is, is going to do. Yeah. So that's available in places like Toronto, but not somewhere like, you know, in Montreal, Mont- it's Montreal. not even available in Montreal right now. I don't even have to like, pick a rural town. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy to me anyways, but so yeah, that, that's a good point. So we're getting there. So that's encourage that part and you can get things in, things yeah. online. You can actually some vape stores sell them in Toronto too. The True. Kits. Um, so that's good. So it's then another part of it now, a big part. So maybe you've agreed for, to sit with somebody mm-hmm. or, you know, you've agreed to help them plan for when they're going to take a substance. Setting expectations is a very good thing. Um, and letting them know ahead of time what your role is in that reminding them I'm not a therapist here. I'm not a shaman, unless you are. <laughs> if you specifically yeah. are those things, <laughs> fine, great. And great, and even better. <laughs> but yeah, if you're exactly. not those things, then simply remind people, just like a first aider. So I always like to bring trip sitting and first aid together. Um, yeah. Quickly, my background is I was a paramedic for a well, while, tr- moved into the addictions and mental health field. I'm, I now work at the safe injection site, and I also uh, do case management for a community mental health team. So I do have a lot of experience with the emergencies with, um, you know, medical emergencies, substance use and mental health crisis emergencies. Um, So I'm hoping to bring a lot of that into this. 
Um, which is why it's good to compare first aid to trip sitting because a first aider is not a paramedic or a doctor or a nurse. Um, a first aider is going to do the best that they can with their training, not cross any ethical boundaries, and then they'll know if and when to call for extra help. And good news with psychedelics, if you've done all that preparation work of testing, the person's aware of the substance, the dose they take, they're aware of what that dose might do for them. Because with psychedelics, we are all various in how we will react based on many factors. But there are some rules of thumb with dosing we can talk about after this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, someone they have to know the dose, um, the purity, and then setting expectations of saying, yes, I am here to hold space. I'm not here to counsel and cure because that's complex and you can actually do harm. Also reminding people that as things come up, there's no judgment, that you're there just to be a space holder, to reflect to them and to be compassionate and a partner um, while they're going through that. And also maybe setting some boundaries, like yes. if some certain things come up, like the person becomes suicidal, which is rare, or they become aggressive. What is our plan of what I'm going to do if that happens? Um, also asking them, are there any concerns that have come up before if they've done substances like this or that they're dealing with in their life that they're afraid might come up? And then what are some things I might be able to say or do to help you with that and, and help you with coping yeah. with it? And that's sometimes that's similar to like um, the what what can I do to help you if you're like in a in having difficulty or like panicking or something it's usually similar to what the person um might like from someone that would help them with a panic attack in like being sober right so um i used to tell my partners um like in just regular daily life you know if i have a panic attack by the way this is what i cannot deal with like like it can be different for everyone some people will like to have like a hug a tight hug over them some people will don't don't touch me um glass of water whatever get some air encourage me to like you know sit down or whatever and that can be useful to do usually just in daily life but also in trip sitting um to ask the person like you know they usually know that the, they they usually they know themselves better than anyone else right so sometimes it's just articulating it you have to help them with that maybe you yeah. know and sometimes that's being very patient because if somebody is on a very high dose certain psychedelics like mdma um if it's pure it's a phenethylamine where you don't typically lose a lot mm. of your perceptions like you're able to understand what's going on around you and yeah. more so within you it like puts you more in touch with those things yeah so you're able to say things like oh i think i need to you know go to the bathroom or I think I need you to kind of, you know, rub my back or something that will come up more with MDMA. Whereas things like psilocybin and LSD, it might be more likely you'll enter a state that it's hard to articulate yourself because sure. of the different ways that the brain, the brain, um, the, sorry, the different brain activity, it's not coming down that centralized highway that we're used to it all coming down so uniformly that we can just, okay, here's my thoughts. Here's what I'm trying to get out it is taking some detours to keep it simple. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So, so maybe I'm saying to you, I, uh, and you can just see I'm uncomfortable. You might say, Jake, is there, you know, would you like to go for a walk? You know, suggesting very common things. Um, and I think a good thing to remember is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Just start to meet them with that. And it starts with biological, you know, have they been drinking water? Have they had enough food? Have they gone to the bathroom? Are they aware they can do those things? Cause sometimes you need that reminder. Um, uh, are they able to use the space around them and feel safe in it? Are they feeling comfortable with yeah. you? Or, you know, are they feeling in control of their body and environment? And then if those things are intact socially, are they feeling connected, you know, to the environment, yeah. to you, to others in their life that maybe they're having realizations of certain relationship things they're concerned about, um, you know, and that might come up. And then once they have your biological, your psychological and your social well-being addressed, that's when people become motivated, more self-aware, exactly. and they yeah. can start to actually overcome some of these challenges more and then yeah. self-actualize, hopefully. Yeah. Someone in the comments says that uh, they imagine there is a lot of patience involved in this type of work and that compassion is also very important to be able to hold space so the person can feel at home and safe. And that's exactly, yes, patience is very important for me, I believe, in trip sitting. For this exact reason that you just said, Jake, like the person is not, you're not going to be in the same logical 
thinking level of being able to just, well, so I'm feeling cold, so I need a sweater. Like, it's not going to be as easy as this. <laughs> and that's the, one of the, the perks of having a trip sitter too, to be able to have someone there um, to just like deal, try to deal with what's going on, right? And the patience, I think, is the most key to maintaining trust and maintaining like the rapport yeah, and, and, and maintain that holding space really is patience. Yeah. And at the safe injection site, there's times where people are, are in an altered state for quite some time. And I mean, am I just going to call the police because I don't want to deal with that? No, that's no. not a police call. That's something that they might just need some time. And as long as they're not yeah. threatening themselves or other people, people can be in crisis for you know, sometimes up to an hour yeah. and it, it can take to deescalate. So remember those basic things. I love how you bring that up too. It's just basic stuff. Um, yeah. Ask them to take some deep breaths with you. Um, there's yeah. an acronym I like to use to help um, keep that patience going. It's called PACE, PACE yourself. Yeah. So it's a motivational interviewing technique. Um, it's something you can look up online, but the P stands for partnership always reflect to them if they're, if they're struggling to articulate or they're cycling through um, or looping through certain thoughts, just remind them you're there with them. They're not alone. You're here to work through it with them. Um, autonomy is the A in pace. They're, it's their autonomy, their body, their decisions are theirs. You're just here to support them. C is compassion, which you talked about perfectly. Yeah. You're just reflecting to them. Hey, I just want the best for you, not for me, for you. I'm just here to watch and help and be there. Um, and then the E is evocation. Let them come to their own conclusion. There's nothing worse. And I've seen this a lot with um, clients I in know. crisis where you try to correct it for them. Well, look, I get what you're saying. You just need to, you know, talk to this person or, you know, get this job and you'll be fine. And they need to get it out themselves. So yeah, should, let them come to it. Exactly. And I think that also we talk a lot about set and setting and, you know, a lot of people kind of know what it is and whatever, but in trip sitting, we, we can't forget that the, per the trip sitter is part of the set and setting. Like if you're becoming flustered because the person is not talking fast enough for you, this is energy that this person can feel and it can lead to very like negative moments or like very hard moments and like challenges. If the person is already vulnerable because that's what they are, they're taking a substance that breaks down a little bit of their consciousness of themselves and their ego and whatever and you're there Defenses. and you're and they feel like you're getting annoyed with them that can be very hard and mo even more so for people that have trauma relating to this exact type of feeling as well but tr they're trying to overcome feeling inadequate feeling not good enough whatever and it's like that's important. This is great because I just uh, today finished listening to, um, there's a Psychedelics Today podcast, which is wonderful. Um, yeah. Uh, these, these folks in Colorado, um, Joe, Kyle, and Michelle, uh, they're doing great work out there. And they created this uh, Psychedelics Today course that you can take about navigating psychedelics. It's great. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, but what they had Robin Carhart Harris on, and they were asking him questions about neuroplasticity in the psychedelic state. And what that means is, yes, sometimes under overwhelming states of not just psychedelics, just overwhelming states, trauma, crisis, and psychedelics, the mind becomes neuroplastic, meaning it's susceptible to changes in the way it's wired and the way it perceives reality and situations, then that doesn't have to be negative. I mean, typically that can be a wonderful thing. Yeah. You know, someone can, can change their perspective on, you know, depression, help them overcome trauma. But just like you said, if the set and setting is not great, just like if, you know, back in the day when it used to just be, you, someone would call 911, a police officer would chase someone through a field on LSD. That is <laughs> not great for long-term trauma, but at the yeah. time, no one understood that stuff. Like the cop doesn't know that, like at the time, yeah. like, oh, this person's being traumatized. They think, oh, whatever. But I think now we understand. So you as a, a, a space holder or a trip sitter, whether it's someone in crisis or someone on a psychedelic in altered state, reminding, remembering they actually do sense things. It's not that they're wrong. They're not being incorrect about it, delusional. Oftentimes they're super in tune because yes. the, the, the um, barriers are down. They're, they're not going to have that filter of, oh, I noticed that you're not getting along with me, but I'm not going to say anything because it's uncomfortable. They feel it deeply. They so, feel it in their bones. And it's like, 
it can be psychosis too though right like yeah it's psychosis or crisis they're not wrong like if you're trying and i've had times where i'm too tired maybe at the end of a long shift maybe it's really overwhelming that day and i have a client that says you know i'm in crisis and i'm trying to be there for them but mentally i'm depleted they can feel that and even though the intention isn't to dismiss them they go do you really care are you listening? And they're not wrong in that reading. Yeah. But it's like, no, I want to care, but I'm just done. Yeah. So you're right. People yeah. know they're not wrong when they're picking yeah. that up. And I think that's why it's also important when we talk about trip sitting, we talk a lot about um, getting the other person to tell us their boundaries and to tell us what they'd like. But it's also very important for the person that is going to hold the space to tune in with themselves before be like, hey, so how do I feel today? Do I feel that I have enough mental space to be able to like be there for a person? Do I have, am I tired? Am I hungry? Am I dehydrated? And to like, you also have to be in a good space to hold space for someone. That's the, I think the main theme here, I think it's great to touch on is how to know you're ready to trip sit or that someone's ready to trip. Just before we go there, I just want to say that someone was saying in the comments um, that they work in a retreat center um, in Peru and for for plant medicine. And they have a group share after each plant ceremony. And um, they, this person agrees that people come in, come to these realizations like Jake mentioned and listening to these people with patience is key being present with these people it's really a breakthrough to witness people almost healing in front of you this is also very gratifying and that's true wow thank I love you. that thank you for sharing that because yeah. that does come from a, a, you know it, it's cross-cultural it's it's everywhere um that regardless of what's what brings you to that state the compassion mm-hmm. and i think that's where it comes down to that this is the way to lead into that how do you know you're ready is can you be that authentic person and what happens sometimes when we're tired or we're scared or overwhelmed is we dismiss other people's suffering because it's too painful so let's remember that empathy is wonderful but compassion i've been hearing from mindfulness practitioners that the difference between empathy and compassion is empathy might make you feel that pain and it could be depleting it could be a, almost a burden you take on because you're really in that with them compassion yeah. it's more about seeing them as someone on their own journey where yes you can yeah. feel with them but you're not going to be pulled into the suffering at the level that they're at but like you could still see them as a different person who is on their journey and you have faith that they will find their way in that journey yeah. Um, that's where you get that patience. And I, I've noticed that since I took, you know, different ways of, of, um, you know, getting therapy and help, um, from burnout while working through the front lines of this pandemic, my ability to exercise compassion has become easier instead mm. of just being painfully empathetic towards others. So thank True. you for sharing that, um, uh, in the comments there. Yeah. Um, that's how to be effective is make sure your needs are met. Are you, like yeah. you said, are you sleeping hydrated? Have you eaten? Are you emotionally available? That term yeah. that comes up in relationships yeah. all the time. And someone else says, um, meet people in their current reality, avoid mm-hmm. imposing your own in those spaces. And that's so true is meeting the person where they are. And I think that's what I was saying before about how, how harm reduction applies to so many things in life, because I think that's also in the core of it to not to be humble to be humble about the fact that you don't know everything even if you have like years of training for something you might have qualities that would make you a good person to hold that kind of space but you will never know what the person needs more than they do so to be humble and to listen and to like be there and be open to meeting the person where they are currently, even though you think that they should be somewhere else because you would have done it differently that, or you think that In like, your, it's so important. That's the funny part. We, we, we forget that us where we are had so many factors, right? Yeah. That like, I mean, Roxanne, where you are to do what I would do right now. I mean, that's so ridiculous for, and for me to be able to yeah. do what you can do. It's just, it's a, it's yeah. a, it's this cycle that we're, we get lost in. Um, that's why I hate the whole idea of, come on, just suck it up. It's all about willpower. You got this. You just got to get up in the morning, put your shoes on and run. We all know who we're talking yeah. about. Right? Um, but, um, but there's the idea is people who are in that mind state have their needs met. You know, there's some level of, you know, they're eating and sleeping well. They're not struggling with a medical or mental health disorder or, you know, 
whatever. And that's a good point yeah. of reality. So I, I didn't want to get too far from reality there. The idea of not switching up or imposing yours. Um, and even when somebody is experiencing altered states in everyday life, I, I like to use that term instead of psychosis because we're learning more and more the framework should change around that and that the way we experience reality, even if it's yeah. causing distress, it doesn't mean that's wrong. It's just true. We all have different experiences. So I would never tell someone who's I'm trip sitting for it when they say, oh my gosh, I'm becoming this like demon right now. The better thing to do is kind of ask them more about it. You know, like, mm -hmm. what does that mean to you? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and if they say like, oh, you know, they, they voice some type of ideology towards you. It's not the time to have an argument about political beliefs in the trip sitting state at all. Oh just God. like with someone's drunk, yeah. you know, arguing's not going to go anywhere well. But you just want to be like, and, and even if they say something like um, that goes against you, your core values, hold on to that and compartmentalize that for well after and maybe yeah. address that with a friend. And then it's, think if it's that appropriate to bring up to this person, depending on your relationship. If yeah. you're like a good friend with them, sure, you can address that later, but mm -hmm. it might challenge your beliefs, um, mm -hmm. you know, by or during or integration, if you plan integration. on doing integration work afterwards too, which we won't really talk in depth about today, but like, I think integration is also part of it. And it's, there's a space there if the person, the other, if everyone involved is willing to have that, that moment of integration, um, debriefing together, that can be something that can be brought up then. You know, you said, you said that, you said those things, you know, how, how do you feel about it now? You know what, and you can talk about it. Well, that's how some growth can happen where, you know, and it has happened. I've seen it um, w when folks are working together in altered states. So I might bring up like something that is racist or sexist. That was a belief they held on to, but they're actually trying to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And in this state, they finally have access to the ability to realize how horrible that is. And yeah. they're almost trying to express it to you by saying like, I don't want this anymore, but it may trigger you in a way that you just kind of shut them down. And that's you being mm -hmm. human. But if you can go, wait, this is a chance to grow. You don't have to yeah. be that way anymore. And I accept you for your growth mm -hmm. through this. Um, and I think like when we're, when I, if I go back to the question, like, how do I know I'm ready to trips it? I think that is one question that we should ask ourselves. Am I ready to hear stuff that can be very hard to hear? That can be tr like traumatizing experiences that the person had in the past. Can, am I ready to hear this? Um, am I in a place where I can react appropriately to what is being said to me? Am I in a place that I can hear opinions that differ or that are so far from my personal beliefs? Am I in a space where I can, you know, like... You have to be ready for if, anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Literally anything can come out of the mouth of someone who's tripping. And even big life things, like what if they say to you like, oh my God, we're all going to die. And oh my God, I'm going to lose yeah. everybody. And you're not ready to accept that. It's like, That's well, I'm so, sorry, but they're yes. you can't tell them. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, uh. Don't think about it. Don't it's think okay. About that. Let's watch a movie. Uh. But you're just telling yourself that basically. Like, yeah, if you That's have like, one, yeah. you're having an existential crisis right now, maybe it's not the best moment to have a trip sitting experience. And let's know? be honest as humans, like maybe you have a sick family member or there is something yeah. really going on in your life and it's authentic to feel triggered by those things. That might be a time to say so look, you know, my father's in the hospital or, you know, I, yeah. I'm having issues with my, my mother. I'd rather just wait a bit. That's totally yeah. more um, professional than, yeah. and it's not, so, it's not batting them away. Maybe it's look, mm -hmm. I'll have a conversation with you, but I just don't feel I'm ready to be in that space with you. Um, and I think that's a problem with mental health professionals and healthcare professionals when it comes to compassion fatigue. It's that yeah. people don't do and act in ways that they want to harm and cause suffering when you're in that field. People sometimes they lose they lose that um availability, the resources. Mm -hmm. And then or the they're, come out. they're caught in like cut resources, they're understaffed, the funding goes away, and like the whole shebang that we already know is happening in in like social fields caring fields basically where like, helper fields is like, yeah uh, i've heard it said before any any yeah. field that you're part of your role is helping others even that's customer yeah. service really yeah and honestly through it so yeah um wow so this is interesting with that like the setting we talked about setting expectations we've talked about that kind of checking with yourself mm -hmm. making sure you're ready 
Um, and I often have the reason why I walked in, I walk into work whenever I work at the safe injection site is I have this 45 minute walk where I get to go through my thoughts. So maybe that's another thing is talking with a person, having a good long conversation before and talking about safety planning of like, what if a concern comes up that, you know, you're in crisis and we can't deescalate. Is there someone we can call that you trust a friend, a family member? Um, you know, a, a professional, mm-hmm. even, you know, a crisis line, you know, what would that look like if we were to call a crisis line together, an anonymous one, and we don't have to mention you're on a psychedelic, we can just say my friends here with me going through a tough time, crisis lines don't just call 911 on you, unless you actually voice to yeah. them that you're a threat to safety to yourself or others. Yeah. So that's another great um, example. I think in, in some parts of the States, they have psychedelic hotlines. They don't have that yet in Canada, but oh my Yeah, God, there's like the fi- Fireside Project. Yeah, we need yeah. more of that. Like it'd yeah. be great when, if Canada had that, right? Um, yeah. So safety planning, um, another part to safety plan for is what if there is something like a physical injury? You know, mm-hmm. not that these things happen a lot. Yeah. I will tell you, rarely when I worked as a paramedic did I respond to people injured on a psychedelic or an altered state. Yeah. But when it but happens, sometimes you slip, you slip you and slip. you fall. There like, you go. Yep. sometimes it happens. Or you have an adverse reaction that you just can't yeah. put your finger on. Like some panic attacks yeah. can be so overwhelming that people pass out. They can feel like a seizure or a heart attack. Yeah. And there's times where it's not, you just have a plan. Okay, like if I feel I need to call 911, how do we go about preventing that mm-hmm. if we can, but then submitting to it if that's our reality? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, true. Actually, yeah. Um, and like, I think also on a lighter note, like just planning, you know, you're going to go a whole day. Let's say you're planning a trip for like, I don't know, eight hours, something like that. Um, you know, if you're going to the, like I said before, like if you're going to the person's place, let's say, you're trip sitting and you go to an environment that you don't really know that well as a as a trip sitter you know know where the first aid kit is know where like ask these questions you know um sometimes what i do for my own trips and for my friends too are like i I'm, i should really have a kindergarten because it's really something that calls me but like i prepare fruits in advance um, you know, I cut up fruits and vegetables for them, easy snacks that you can um, get. Should I know about any allergies? That's um, you know, if that's if you're planning on cooking up something for someone or whatever, you know, um, stuff like that to just like prepare the space, you know, uh, do you typically like where is it going to happen? Do you want are you comfortable? Do you have any covers, sweaters? If you're cold, if you're too hot, do you have a fan? uh music whatever like it's a whole set and setting and that's my sanctuary experience talking you know to set up a space where people feel safe and feel that you're like a little bit like proof safe proofing the space basically no sharp edges and no like water on the ground you know don't run around the pool and like just Just like like your just like your preparation to hit those like physical mental social emotional have those plans for meeting needs physical mental social emotional even to have them write out like a four square little box chart with you and go Oh, good. So we can go for a walk. Maybe they have a backyard they can go outside and sit in. Yeah. Maybe they say, no, we can't go out there. My but, neighbors are going to yeah. call 911 right away. Yeah. <laughs> and that's good to know. One that is that comes up, actually, and you have to think about it before, is what happens. Do you turn off your phone? Mm. What happens if your mom calls? Ah. What happens if your boss calls? What happens if someone shows up at the door? You know, what, do, how do you want me to respond? Do you want me to say that you're not there? Do you want me to say that you're not, I don't know, like go over a scenario that is kind of like foolproof. Or even have so them like, like let people know ahead of time. Oh, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, unavailable, going to hike or something. I don't know. Like I'm not yeah, gonna yeah. Be available if they, but yeah, that's part of that great preparation part is yeah. Yeah, like meeting those, um, the concerns and nipping those before they happen. Because look, the, the reality is you don't hear a lot of stories in the news and not a lot of 911 calls to psychedelic experiences because they're relatively safe when the needs are met. Yes. So as long as you prevent and prepare, way less likely that there's going to be an emergency. 
it's kind of like Murphy's law. You may have heard of this. I'm not sure how much validity it would have, but Murphy's <laughs> law is, a, is basically, I call it a saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anything that can go wrong will. So for example, you and your head are saying, oh, there's no way they're going to fall and trip over that rug I have that's curled up there. There's no way. That's exactly where they're going to trip and hit their head. <laughs> it, paramedics learn this all the time. Oh, the elevator seems kind of broken. Don't worry. Uh, we'll be able to go down the stairs and the stairs are blocked. Like something weird. You know, yeah, so yeah. I think it's good to, to prepare. And I think here's a good point. What are some things people can do to arm themselves with knowledge and skills that a good, an ethical and good trip setter would have? Like, for example, hmm. a CPR and first aid course. Is yeah, I think that accessible. would be, yeah, I think that would be good. Also, depending on how much drug testing you did before or how much, like how much, you know, the substance that's going to be taken, uh, not, um, Narcan training. Please do that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, to have the Narcan kit with you. Right now, they're actually, I don't know how it is in um, where you live, Jake, but here in Quebec, um, there there's not a lot of um, injection Narcan going around anymore. It's the nasal spray. The nasal spray. Now, th that's what they give at the pharmacy. When you go in, you, you don't even need to have a, a Medicare card here in Quebec anyways. You can just go in and say, I need a Narcan kit because someone in my... Like I know people that take drugs and they they can give it to you and they can tell you how to use it too. So that's really cool. Oh. Is that the Narcan stash? Yes. <laughs> I was trying to do it slick while you were talking, but it's hard with this microphone. It's actually pretty good. So there's two types I have here and this yeah. is really good to show people. In Ontario, very accessible. But yes, there is a bit of a global, I heard, shortage of the intramuscular. Um, luckily, it hasn't affected us in the front lines. We still have plenty that we use in our sites. We okay. don't typically use the nasals in our injection sites. Mm -hmm. Paramedics typically wouldn't go for them because they're so abrupt, but they work so well. So like the same reason why you as the lay responder should use this, the healthcare professional and, yeah. and, and veteran community drug user kind of avoids these ones. Mm -hmm. um, but hey, look, it will save the life. Yeah. It, it, and you're it, also it's more used to like using needles and stuff. I think it could be a little bit scary for anyone out there without a proper training and experience to like use a needle or, it's and daunting. for many other reasons too. So and like there's the spray. There's yeah, ways yeah, to make exactly. mistakes with needles where this, yeah. the only mistake you can make is not giving it when you should, I guess. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. So the good news with Narcan in general is it doesn't have any um, side effects other than it could put the person into withdrawal. So that's yeah. the one big thing. And this is why we roll people on their side. So here's what the nasals look like. If you can kind of see here, it comes yeah. with an instruction guide inside. You simply pull the tab yeah. down, oh, down there and there you go right up their nose and it's mm -hmm. a spray whole dose right up the nose. Yeah. That's it. And it I guess the only mistake five minutes. The only mistake is like to put it in their ear or their yeah. mouth. <laughs> don't get creative. <laughs> Just know? like Pulp Fiction had the needle in the heart. We don't do that. Uh, no, no. <laughs> uh, imagine how anticlimactic Pulp Fiction would be if John Travolta just gave her a nasal spray on the couch and she was like, oh, I'm fine. Let's go back dancing. <laughs> oh my God. It would be movie. amazing. It would be amazing. <laughs> I would pay to see that. Oh yeah. It's still be a great movie. <laughs> Um, so there's the nasals. Yeah. It's super easy. It comes at two. The rule of thumb is if you feel the person is overdosing on an opioid, they're not responding to you. They're not breathing effectively. Meaning you're not seeing their chest take full breaths. They're making gurgling or snorting sounds, snoring sounds. They're maybe turning like a purple blue color around their lips or face. Sometimes the nail beds. That is where you're going to go. Okay. Time for Narcan. If you are someone who's trained in oxygen and you're, you're actually a harm reduction worker with all those other tools, go by your protocol. But if I'm just on the street and this is all I got, if I see somebody yeah. is not breathing effectively, I can't wake them up. They're not responding appropriately. Mm -hmm. You can give one spray up the nose after rolling them on their side first. You know, you'll learn that in a first aid course it's called the recovery position. You can Google it too. There's pictures. Roll them on their side. One spray up the nose. Wait three to five minutes. Another mistake people make. They go dose, dose, dose because they're nervous and they don't yeah. want this person to die. But Narcan can take some time. And if you overdose someone on Narcan, it's not they're going to have specific harm, but you could put them in withdrawal and that can yeah. be dangerous too. Yeah. So, and for you as well. When they and for you. Up. And it's not, yeah, it's, it, there is a, it's not the myth that they hate you and they want to, you took their no. high away. It's that it's you're just a stranger like, in their face and yeah, they're exactly. dying and they don't know you.
Yeah. So anyone, that's why it's a harm reduction worker. Typically a lot, even people who don't use our site know us. So when yeah. I say I work at this site, I'm a harm reduction worker. They're waking up a lot calmer. Yeah. I'm just, Hey, I'm Jake. We're on the TTC, <laughs> the streetcar. It's I'm not known. Yeah. To them. So, and also yeah. one other thing that I want to point out is that um, if you're not sure that they're overdosing on opioids, mm -hmm. you can, you can give Narcan. Yeah. You can still give it. You will not like have them get, it will not bring them to a high. You, you will not do damage by giving Narcan to someone who doesn't need Narcan. No. No, it's actually, and it will not work on any other drug. So yeah. if you give the Narcan and it works, you know what that they're overdosing on. If it doesn't work, you're just calling 911. And that's the protocol. Yeah. If you're giving it and you're not a harm reduction worker or a healthcare worker at a facility, you're calling 911 because Narcan can wear off. So you're giving the dose, you're calling 911, and then you're following yeah. instructions. Yeah. Um, great. So that's really easy. Um, I can quickly show people the injection one. Yeah. And kind of just, I, it's going to be difficult on this camera here, but I'm going to do And then best. after after we have a question that I, I want us to answer. Is it one that we can't, we should answer now or should I do this? No, no, you can do that. Okay, you cool. can show the, the thing. So this is the injectable kits. I, this is the training one I have. So the Narcan is well, well expired. Good news though. Narcan still works when it's expired, like for quite a while. I if that's all you have. Numbers. Yeah. Yes, if that's all you have, pens. give it. Yeah. The, the way to know it's not good is if it looks dis, like discolored, it should be clear. If it, like in the syringe, if it's discolored or has particles in it, no good. Okay. Um, great. So the injectable ones, they come with um, a face shield for breaths. Now, of course, most people, especially during COVID, are not comfortable doing the breaths. That's fine. Um, if somebody is not breathing at all, chest compressions work very well at circulating the blood around. Perfect. And actually in getting their lungs to compress and move oxygen. But yes, that's in there. Maybe they have a friend nearby that is comfortable or a family member that says, I'll give the breaths, rescue breathing. Perfect. Um, inside as well, you have vials of Narcan. They look like this. Mm -hmm. This is where the training is great. You don't, you can actually, when you go to your pharmacist and ask for training, the pharmacist will train you in Ontario. They'll, they'll. Yeah, same here. You, same oh, here. great. Good. Um, and sometimes you get lucky and they come with these types of, uh, they're called yeah. like, crackers. If you don't have it though, the alcohol swabs inside. This is an old paramedic trick when you don't have these available, you use the alcohol swab. You yeah, because it's glass, right? It's still it's glass. glass. And you're gonna be breaking it, right? So bare yeah. fingers, not safe in case it shatters or mm. the edge comes towards you. Yeah. So these are awesome. They come in most of them. If not, you can take the alcohol swab. Um, it's hard to see on here, but there is a line where the yeah, glass we see is weak. It. Good. Um, Sometimes there's a, a dot and you want to pull um, away from the dot or sorry, towards the dot. That's how you know it's the weak spot. So just simply right over the vial, pull towards you. There we go. Usually there's sharps containers. If not, the actual kits themselves are pretty good at, at holding like shards of glass because they're so thick, like the material in them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you have nothing else, put everything back in here. Mm -hmm. So now this is our open Narcan. The good note, news about it, how easy it is, is that you're giving the entire dose in a vial. Yeah. At the safe injection sites and even paramedics, sometimes we give different dosing depending on the level of overdose. But the lay person, this person is turning blue or not breathing effectively, you give the entire dose. Needle comes out like this. It's mm -hmm. a three, mil, three milliliter. That's what it holds. And you're only going to take in one. There's only one milliliter in there. So you have room to pull air if you make a mistake, which is great. So the needle, some of them, they come with like a safety button that after you've given the dose, you can yeah. hit the button, the needle sucks right in. Retractable needle. Yeah, that's, that's cool. But this one has a safety glide that I can actually slide over the syringe when I'm done. So the cap comes off. Always make sure there's no one around that are going to get poked with this. <laughs> and it's an intramuscular needle, meaning that you're going directly 90 degrees into the shoulder muscle or the outer thigh muscle. So now that the needle's out, you're going to take it, you're going to put it into the vial like this. It's going to be hard to see, but I'll do my best. So it's in there. And it's good to hold it on a bit of an angle to let the fluids fall. And then you're going to slowly pull it up into the syringe. You can see the fluid. You have lots of room to pull in some air, so that's okay. Try to get all of the fluid. Sometimes you can turn it a bit. It actually helps. Great. So I've got the entire milliliter in there. Make sure the vial, you keep track of it so no one sits on it or breaks it by accident. You can now see there's tons of air. So I'm going to push out the air. 
Now, the good news, if you were to just give this with the air, it wouldn't kill anybody. It takes a whole hundred cc line of air going into directly into a vein to cause um, an embolism to hurt someone. So I'm going to push out all of the air. Boom, just like that, as much as possible. And now it's ready to give. I have a ball somewhere around here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just simply 90 degrees directly in. Boom. And then you just advance the needle. Oops, all the way. And now it's given. Pull it out. There you go. And then if there's a safety glide, click it over like that. It's now mm -hmm. safe. If not, you just press the button a little bit more and then the needle retracts. Those are great. And I've had it before. And this is rare, but I had had to give Narcan to somebody who really was unresponsive, but they were coming in and out of it a bit. And when I gave the Narcan, they actually were conscious enough to grab at my hand. And this can happen. Sometimes people are overdosing what's called a flail state. So they're not quite conscious and alert, but they are mm. mobile and they're not controlling it. It's called a dyskinesia that sometimes fentanyl and strong opioids can cause. So that guy grabbed my hand, but it's okay because our professional needles we carry in the sites have that button. So I pushed the button, needle sucked in, and now it doesn't matter. If he pulls that needle out of my hand, it's not going to be a sharp and I'm okay. Yeah. So be very careful and tell people what you're doing. I'm going to give you some Narcan. You're overdosing. You're not breathing effectively. Give it mm -hmm. and then back away when yeah, you're in that recovery position. That's a good point. Good. I hope that helped. Yeah. I mean, it's not the easiest to see, but yeah. I mean, just to talk through it and see the general motions. Yeah. Um, and like, you can really look online as well. Uh, you can talk to your pharmacist. There's even some organizations usually that do harm reduction that will give these trainings for free. And it's like a more complete training. They'll talk to you about like a bunch of stuff as well. That's good to yeah. know. I think we'll do more webinars that kind of break some things down more. Like, um, yeah. like I think like the idea of like, set and setting could be a whole webinar mm -hmm, like responding for sure. to overdoses and emergencies yeah. um sex harm reductions another one that doesn't get talked yeah. about enough that would be a wonderful yeah. webinar so yeah. yeah and so before we go um and i think that's a great question to end with actually um someone asked in the chat are there certifications or recognized services for trip sitting or is it not yet officially regulated because of legality hmm we're, and it's okay to, you don't have to say where you are because unfortunately there's, there are some, but like MAPS, for example, is, is creating, has created some that they're putting therapists through for MDMA training and they have very specialized protocols in Canada there. They are already hiring psychotherapists and counselors for yeah. psycho, uh, psychedelic therapy. Yeah. So you just need to be certified as a, um, have a master's, I believe in social work, have a, uh, psychotherapy designation yeah. um, and a couple other caveats um, and then you can actually do that so if you are already yeah. like a registered psychotherapist there are I saw a job posting for field trip for like oh we're hiring a psychedelic count like psychotherapist therapist yeah I like, oh, so, no, I, I, so I guess <laughs> I guess uh, in official so if we're talking trip sitting there would be like trip sitting that's not therapy and then trip sitting that is therapy so I guess what you're talking about is more therapy. That's what they have more available, so, regulated, yeah. but unregulated. And not, I wouldn't shouldn't use that wording because some of the people doing this are regulated professionals like myself. Yeah, and yeah. Like some of and us. they just can't, they just can't advertise it because they would be in trouble. Right. So right? I think there are some, and I think the one to start yeah. at, that's not quite, I would say official, but navigating psychedelics is the most comprehensive. Um, I'm not sure if you've taken that one, Roxanne, but um, they have one for clinicians as well, like a version, mm -hmm. and you get a certificate and they have physicians, they have doctors, they have social workers that are on that help build that course. So, I mean, in every way, other than like the government doesn't agree with psychedelics yet, <laughs> it's official. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, like if you put on a resume, I don't know if it would translate the same as like, you know, social service worker designation mm -hmm. but they're there and i i took it and i hold on to it and i took mm -hmm. one about ayahuasca and allopathic medicine that that was available online that yeah some people might recognize that some yeah. might not depends on the employer right yeah i think the more you just kind of take things now and build your own path forward yeah. um, you'll be able to access those those positions yeah. more and like um so also like the, um jake and i we met through uh the training that or like the yeah, 
training, I guess, workshop about trip sitting, trip sitting 101 that uh, Jake put on with uh, Jameson mm -hmm. a while back. Um, so there's like these, for sure, this kind, this type of thing, what we're doing right now, but also like uh, the workshop that I was just talking about, you can find those online too. I would say to always be using your critical judgment about like who's giving this, you know, what information are they giving the kind of philosophy that they have um so like i think like anything um so i think that there's a lot of classes workshops yep that you can find online um like in societies are always offering them like yeah i, I exactly. met jameson through like just doing workshops through toronto psychedelic society yeah exactly Ralph kitchener waterloo psychedelic society yeah. So, um, yeah. And we're actually working with a few people on building something as well. So, yeah. and we're going to try yeah, to exactly. that as, as a, as a credit as, as we can. So yeah. it's all about what the government allows right now. I think like moving forward for sure, it's going to be more and more possible to be open about these things and to actually have like certification kind of thing, like a 101, 102, 103 class that you can give. Like that's, I think it's going to pop up more and more in the next years um and oh so uh the person that was asking the question just put a link in the chat uh the it's psychedelic education center.com is that the oh, one that you're wow, talking about you. <laughs> navigating psychedelics um it might be uh, let me check the look at the comment yeah um it might be it might not be uh, let me see here am i having issues seeing the comments um hmm no trouble I could put you the link in the chat if you want. Oh, I see it. It is the one. It it is the one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. All right. Great. Cool. Yeah. So that is the one. So that is the one we had. Um, okay. I took. I loved it. And like I said, that's a good one to add to your credentials. And I think at this point, it's about building your credibility and your exactly. comfort, right? So yeah. take a CPR and first aid course. That's what I was so going like, to say. Be prepared yeah. for that. Maybe take the mental health first aid course. I think it's mm -hmm. great. I, I have been teaching that through a company, um, a first aid company. It's the mental health first aid program through the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Um, St. John Ambulance has a tons of different types of mental health resiliency courses. Um, yeah. So anything to do with physical and mental health is going to help yeah. prepare you and just studying psychedelics and really grasping the different perspectives mm -hmm. and how they talking to brain. people, talking to people. Of yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> like a big thing for me, for sure. I think that knowing about people's experiences, I used to facilitate integration. I we still do them, but we took a break, yep. but I used to facilitate um, integration circles at the Montreal Psychedelic Society. And so I would hear people's experiences, how they feel, how, what they did in, 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 in their trips and what they get from it and how they behaved. And like, you know, I hear all of this stuff and this is also information that you'll be able to like put to good use if that's your goal. Um, of course, be careful with confidentiality and everything, but like, I mean, yeah, just for, for yourself, sure. you know, like getting an understanding of the, the realm of experiences that can happen in, in psychedelic um, moments, <laughs> psychedelic experiences, altered states of consciousness experiences, you, just in general too. So I think there's a lot of things that you can pull from so many, like for me, sexology is like, I didn't get a, a drug class <laughs> in sexology, but it still made so much sense for me with what I learned to apply this type of philosophy and attitude to like other another field you know so they all interconnect our, our, yeah. our well-being and our experiences yeah. as humans and i think that also to to like just wrap it up for me i think it's important as well to um to get certification and to get education and to get information but also i also like the fact that in psychedelic communities there's a it's a lot more horizontal than in other um more official fields where like i see a lot of com well i deal with community a lot so in the communities i see a lot of like um peer-to-peer -peer hel helping out and like people will want to trip sit for their friend because they know what it feels like they don't have like a bachelor's in psychology and that's like one. that's okay <laughs> you don't need it the absolutely. research supports you don't need it <laughs> exactly so so yeah, I think it's important also to remember, you know, if you feel like 
you have a lot of information and you're ready, you know, you have to also trust yourself. Um, Soft skills matter more. Yeah, yeah, you know? exactly. I, I think mindfulness and meditation is another one, right? It's a back to that self-awareness. The more prepared yeah. you are to handle adversity, to prepared you are to watch someone else go through suffering because they might go through that or just overwhelming emotion and be able to yeah. be comfortable being neutral through that. And then um, being prepared for in case one of those rare situations comes up where it's a crisis or an emergency. Um, so self-awareness, preparedness, and just being like honest and open with learning is yeah. really helpful. And in the next few months, we're going to go more in depth as well in all of these topics, yeah. either through live streams like this. And we're also working on having like a little workshop training thing coming up. So, um, and it'll also be available in French for all of my Quebecers out there <laughs> or French speaking people all over Canada, but like, yeah. Oh, well, that's perfect then. And I think, thank you all for being here. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're going to have it recorded, so uh, we'll have it available. Um, and we'll, we'll try to do, we'll take any feedback too. I mean, if you wanted to share yeah. like what you'd like to see in future webinars. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can always send us questions anytime. And if we can answer in the moment we'll do, and we'll, we can bring, bring these up as well in the, in the next chat. Yep. So you can, you can reach me at the psychedelic society of first responders and emergency workers where this link's kind of through right now. Um, yeah. Roxanne, you're with the Montreal Society, Psychedelic Society. Yeah, that's right. Perfect. Yeah. Um, also, um, the Flight of Thoughts podcast is what I am the host of, which is also another medium where we explore some of these things. I'll have this up potentially audio, audio on there um, to help get it out to more people. Um, and yeah, look forward to um, helping a lot of you grow and feel more yeah. confident and empowered going forward. Yeah. And thank you for for everything is it's so cool chatting with you yeah no it's always fun this is gonna be a, a fun project for sure yeah and uh helping um empower others this is great yes all right thank you everybody all right. take care Yay. <laughs>